and we're recording. The next build system I'd like to introduce is Maven. And this one came out of the Java community in 2001, so it's still quite old, but it's not as old as Make. And it's still in use today as well, and it also has a very good idea in it. Now, the very good idea that turned up in Maven was that, well, most Java projects have a pretty similar structure. So if you look at them, um, they tend to have a source directory where the source code is going to be, obviously. Um, but that source code directory tends to get divided into two parts, main and test. Main is what we need to build our code itself. And that might include some Java files that are in the Java subdirectory. And it might include some non-Java files, resources, config files, image files, text files that go in the resources directory. Um, but it also tends to include some tests, uh, unit tests, which we will meet shortly, um, which will check that our code is working, not just that it compiles, but it, that it does the right thing. And so we write these tests and we keep them in the test subdirectory. Sub and again, there's Java subdirectories where the code lives for the tests and there's resources subdirectories for any, any resources that you might need to go with the tests. And so Maven goes with the idea that, well, look, if most people end up wanting to have a pretty similar uh, similar structure to their project, why don't we say that we're going to require projects to conform to a particular convention, to conform to looking like that. And if the project looks like that, you don't need to define what all the targets are because we're going to be able to predefine that, well, we have a certain number of build phases. We have the phase that's about compiling. We have the phase that is about compiling the tests. We have the phase that is about running the tests on the code to see if they're successful. And so those are all different targets and they depend upon each other, um, but they're not explicitly defined in the build file in the same way that targets are defined in a make file. Um, it also has another rather nice idea in it that saved people an awful lot of time. And that is, look, there's an awful lot of open source code out there. People have written libraries and people like to reuse libraries. But how do you get your libraries that you want to reuse into your project uh, to compile against them? In days gone by, people used to have to download the binaries of the libraries and they'd put them in a libs directory that they'd put on the class path and they would commit them into version control to ensure that everyone in the development team had the same version of the library. Because if you can imagine, if you've got a team of, say, 12 developers and you say, well, we're using the Spoodle library, um, someone's going to go and get the wrong version and then they're going to be writing code that breaks for everyone else. And so people used to commit the libraries into source code into the source code repository. But source code repositories, as we will see as we go along, um, are really designed for text source code files, not for binary um, compiled output files. They're not really designed for keeping the libraries in. Well, Maven had this very good idea that, well, why don't we just say that you just need to tell me what library you're using and what version of that library you're using and I will go and get it for you. Um, so it has this idea that it can fetch libraries automatically from out on the internet so that you don't have to. And so just as there's a source code repository, there can also be artifact repositories, um, systems that store the binary compiled output of projects so that when you run your build system and you say, I need that library, it can go and get it, pull it down as part of the build process and compile the code against it. And so in this case, you know, we might just say that, look, this project is using GDX, libgdx, a graphics library that's produced by Bad Logic Games, and the version that we would like to use is 0.9.9 .9 snapshot. Now, uh, once we've declared that, and when then when we go and do our Maven build, uh, before it compiles our code, there's a preceding phase of its build process in which it will go and um, resolve all the dependencies and see if it's got everything that it needs in order to build that code. And it will go out to the Internet and it will download it. Um, at this point, I should possibly say something about version numbers. 
So this implies that we're going to be able to publish versions of our compiled outputs and put them out there on the internet. There is a bit of a convention that um, most build systems hold to, which is that if you say that you are using version 1.3 of this project, and I already have version 1.3 of this project, I don't need to go and re-download it. OK, that sounds pretty sensible. But what happens if I've produced version 1.3, I've published version 1.3, and then I realize, oh, I just got to fix this last bug here I didn't spot. And I go and fix it, and I recompile it, and I republish, republish it as version 1.3. Well, in that case, someone might previously have done a build, depending on version 1.3. It's pulled down 1.3, the buggy one, and they've built it, and it's got the bug in it. And OK, now I've published my bug fix. But when they rerun their build, it's going to say, no, I've already got version 1.3. I don't need to go out there and get it again. I've got 1.3. And they're still going to have the buggy version. So there tends to be the case that we decide that, look, once we have published a, um, a binary artifact, we've given it a version number and we've published it publicly, it doesn't change. If we want to change it, we need to increment its version number. We need to put an extra 0.1 or something, something on it that means that uh, you can tell your build system, give it a different version number, so it will go and realize, ooh, no, you're not asking for 1.3, you're asking for 1.3.1, and it will go out and refetch it. However, while we are working inside our teams, very often we're doing lots of development. We are still building things in progress, and we're publishing stuff as we go because, look, our teammates need it. Even if, you know, the, if the teammate down the corridor who isn't in the same source code repository as me but is building something that's supposed to work with my library and we're working in parallel, and so he needs to see my changes as I'm publishing them. And so a lot of build systems have the idea that you can have a version which is a snapshot version or a version which is uh, one which we don't assume is always the same. One that we assume, look, each day or every so often, just go and check because there might be a new version. So that's what that 0.9.9 snapshot is. Uh, in this case, it means that this isn't a released version. This is, if you like, a pre-released version published as a snapshot. And the build system could keep should ch keep checking to see if 0.9.9 snapshot has been updated. Um, now, we're not actually going to use Maven in the project this time. Maven is it's, it's a very good system. It is still widespread, widely in use, and we will be seeing Maven artifacts. Um, but the reason that we're not going to use it in the project is because, well, it dates from 2001. And in 2001, the, um, well, XML was popular. And so its build files are in XML and they are quite verbose. They are too big for me to fit on a slide. Uh, so this is the build file from a course I was teaching at UQ a few years ago uh, when we did use Maven. And in this particular case, we, we sort of took a fork of an open source project called RoboCode and we were um, doing interesting different things with it. Um, so the, the, the build file is relatively readable. It's just very verbose. So up the top, it says, look, this is some XML. It says this is a project and it points to the XML namespace of the um, Maven project. Uh, as th and so that, that's what all that stuff is in, in, up in the project tag. And then it says, well, OK, this artifacts ID, I'm giving it the ID robocode.core. That is the name of this artifact. The name of my project is in terms of um, something that is in English, a display name to show to people, robocode core. Um, in this case, this was a, um, a project that had submodules. And so this is the build file of a submodule. Sub and so this says, well, the parent build file to this one uh, was also from the group, you know, UQ CSSE 2003, the course I was teaching back then, uh, with the artifacts ID RoboCode, and the version was 2012.0.1 dash snapshot. So one of those ones where we're going to keep publishing new ones, but it's going to keep updating. And we can then see that there's some dependencies. And so there's a dependency on another module in the same project, in this case, RoboCode.API. 
Um, but if we look down a bit further, there's a dependency on Pico Container, a library from the internet um, produced by org.picocontainer and we want to use version 2.8 and a bit further on JUnit and back then we were using JUnit version 4.9 but so we're, we're not going to use this particular build system um, because it's uh, a little bit verbose uh, to write the configuration files for but the build system that we're going to use is going to be able to work with Maven repositories and Maven dependencies so what I am going to do is I'm going to pop over to the browser and in my browser let's go to a place called Maven Central. So this is the Maven Central repository, which is one of the, the biggest, uh, very public um, artifact repositories out there on the internet. And so let's search for a um, testing framework called JUnit. And here it is, and we can see that it's got a group ID of JUnit, an artifact ID of JUnit, and version 4.12 is the latest version it's got. And we can see that we could get hold of it, the, the, the POM, uh, which is the, the um, well, the, let, let, let's pop in and have a look at it. Why not? Uh, so here is the project object model, the POM, which is um, uh, XML describing this particular project, describing this particular artifact. But we can also see over here, here is how we would include it in our Maven project. And so we can see that, well, if we wanted to include it in a Maven project, we would say we have a dependency and it's on the group ID of JUnit, the artifact ID of JUnit and version 4.12. Uh, but you'll notice that that is not the only build system that you can include this library in. So though uh, Maven itself isn't something we're going to use, we're going to use a build system that can understand uh, Maven projects and Maven repositories and so we're going to use one called uh, Gradle uh, which we'll see in the next video um, but as you can see here if you want to bring in a compile dependency uh, so you just say compile JUnit JUnit 4.12 group ID artifact ID version ID um, that is quite a bit more compact than this XML um, though, as we'll see, this is a testing framework, so we would normally use this particular library in the test f phase of our project. So, in fact, we would say test compile, and you'll see that in the uh, project files that we'll show later on. Um, those of you who have uh, done our Scala course, um, or also possibly in our advanced web programming course where uh, Scala is one of the options, you may have seen the Scala build tool. Scala is a language that isn't Java, but it runs. It can run on the JVM, and so it can use Java libraries, and the Scala build tool uh, understands Maven repositories as well. And so you could say, you know, library dependencies plus equals JUnit, and the artifact ID is JUnit, and the version ID is 4.12. And so um, different build systems have different notations for it but nonetheless they can go out to Maven Central to this repository and they can fetch uh, this artifact for us. Now if you are working on our um, university's uh, well our school's development server and you are inside our firewall and you tell your build system I would like you to go and get this library for me from the internet um, the first thing you're going to bump into is that uh, suddenly the build system needs to get through the firewall to get out to the internet to get it um, what we tend to do is instead of trying to tell Maven or Gradle how to get, Gradle is the one that we're going to use, and we'll see that in the next video. Instead of trying to tell them how to get through the proxy, which we could do, uh, what we've done instead is we have put up our own repository uh, using a thing called Artifactory. This is a, uh, a Maven repository, and we've hosted this at our university. And so instead, if you're on campus, you point your builds and tell the build system, I'd like you to get it from this particular repository. And this is accessible from inside the firewall. And so we don't have to get out through the web proxy. Um, you'll notice, however, that this says that it's just serving 5,395 artifacts. Um, well, if we go to Maven Central um, and we go to the quick statistics, we'll see Maven Central is serving 2 million artifacts. My goodness, that's a lot of libraries out there. Um, or unique artifacts index, 192,000. Okay, not quite so many, but still a lot. 
Um, so what's the go here? Well, what we've done, and this is quite common for companies to do, is they set up their own repository. Um, but they tell their repository about Maven Central and about JCenter and about other ones that are out there on the Internet. And they use it kind of like a cache. So the build system, we tell our build system, get them from Artifactory. And so the build system makes the request for the library to Artifactory and says, Artifactory, have you got this? Can you give it to me? And Artifactory goes, well, have I got this? And it either says, yes, here it is. Or it goes, no, hang on a minute. I'm just going to check about the um, repositories I know of out there on the Internet. Oh, yes, uh, this was in Maven Central. Let me just suck it down, pull it down. And now, yes, I've got it. Here you go. And so it basically it, it's just a little bit slower responding to the request because instead of requ responding to the request immediately uh, to say that it has it, it needs to go out to the Internet to get the library before it can say, yes, I've got it. Here's the library. So it acts like a cache, uh, a caching proxy of those repositories that are out on the Internet. Um, it is also uh, quite useful for companies to have one of these because you can publish uh, privately inside your company. Um, the libraries that you want your company to your employees to be able to use but you don't necessarily want to put out onto the internet or you can do things like we will publish our snapshots our development in progress internally in our company's repository but we won't then push those through to maven central through for the world to use until they're ready for release um, so that was a quick introduction to maven and um, uh, Maven repositories. The other thing that I will do is let's pop inside um, libs release. So this is the URL of one of the repositories rather than just kind of the front end of the hosting system. And you can see that Artifactory eff effectively presents it like nested directories. And so if we pop down and find that um, JUnit testing framework and let's go down here and gosh, there's quite a few in here, 5,000, I guess. And let's click on the group ID of JUnit and the artifact ID of JUnit and version 4.12. And we can see that it's actually got quite a few different files. Um, it has JUnit the jar, the compiled library for building into your project. Um, it also has, however, um, you know, things like S uh, SHA1 and MD5 hashes so that you can check that it came down correctly and so that you can check that, yep, that really is JUnit 4.12. It's not being fiddled around with by someone. Um, it's got um, Javadoc, uh, the generated documentation from comments in the source code. Uh, that's also available as a jar file to download. It's got the source code. It's bundled up the source code so that if you're editing in your development environment and you make a call into the JUnit library, and you click go to source, even though actually you're compiling against the jar file, against the compiled binary, um, well, if you've got the sources jar, it knows what source to show you. And so th th this makes the source code as well as the compiled version available. And it's also got the, um, the project object model uh, file, the XML that we saw before. And if we click on that, well, that's going to download as an XML file. Uh, and it's going to look quite long and ugly and I won't open it up for now. Um, so that was an introduction to Maven and Maven repositories. And in the next video, I'll introduce you to Gradle, which is the, pro the build system that we are going to use uh, in the project this time around.